Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the City Council Committee on Veterans Fiscal 2021 Preliminary Budget Hearing. I am uh, Chaim Deitch, Chair of the Veterans Committee. Today we'll be hearing from James Hennon, the Commissioner of the Department of Veterans Services, or DVS. Thank you, Commissioner, for testifying uh, before the committee today. The Department of Veterans Services Fiscal 2021 Preliminary Budget totals $6.7 million, including $4.4 million in personal services funding to support 49 full-time positions. Established by Local Law 113 of 2015, the department is now in its fourth year of operation. DVS is an important institution with a mission to ensure that the concerns of New York City's over 200,000 veterans are heard and addressed. Now that the agency is up and running, it is the job of this committee to make sure that DVS is making the best use of its resources and fulfill this mission as best as it can be. Uh, with this goal in mind, uh, we hope to gain a clearer understanding of DVS's efforts to identify the most pressing concerns for New York City veterans community and what actions the department is taking to confront these issues. Mm -hmm. We would like to develop a better picture of how DVS is collecting and analyzing data and how the recent launch of VetConnect will impact these efforts. We would like to ga uh, gain greater insight on the day-to-day -day operations of DVS's community outreach, mental health and homelessness prevention program areas, and want to learn more about the work DVS does in the realm of veteran employment. For their help, uh, I'd like to thank um, uh, today's, for today's hearing, um, uh, financial analyst Peter Butler, finance unit head John Russell, committee counsel Nuzad Saudri, uh, policy analyst Kevin Katowski, my citywide veterans uh, director Joe Bello, and my deputy chief of staff uh, Tova Chasinov. Uh, I would also like to acknowledge the members of the committee, uh, council member Alika Ampri Samuel. Uh, thank you again, Commissioner, for testifying before us today. And I would like to ask uh, now. The, I would like to ask the committee council to please administer the oath. Thank you. <clears throat> please raise your right hand. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee, and to respond honestly to council member questions? Good afternoon, Chairman Deutsch, uh, members of the committee and advocates. Uh, I would like to begin by thanking you for the opportunity to discuss DVS's preliminary budget for fiscal year 2021. Uh, my name is James Hendon, and I am proud to serve as the commissioner for the New York City Department of Veterans Services. Uh, I'm joined today by Cassandra Alvarez, associate commissioner for public-private partnerships, and Jason Loughran, our assistant director of special projects at DVS. Each new fiscal year presents the opportunity to take stock of how far we've come examine the city's resources and make decisions that ensure that we can continue delivering the support that our 210,000 heroic veterans and their families across the five boroughs need and have come to depend on. Veterans are more likely to vote, volunteer, and are most civically engaged in their communities than their civilian counterparts. In short, they are one of our city's greatest assets. We are confident that the upcoming budget discussions will translate into a sound financial plan that will enable DVS and the City of New York to provide our veterans with the necessary services they require, further cementing our position as a national model for how to best locally serve those who have defended our country and protect the freedoms that we enjoy. As the first new agency in the City of New York in over 15 years, DVS has diligently worked to onboard a talented, passionate, and diverse group of professionals, many of whom are veterans or current service members, to best match resources through peer support with individual veteran needs. As we embark on this new year, DVS is actively endeavoring to fill our nine remaining vacancies with like-minded, talented, and diverse individuals. We strive each day to reach our authorized strength of 49 employees. In fiscal year 2020, $6.1 million was allocated under the agency's budget for staffing and programmatic functions. As we continue our upward trajectory, DVS stands committed to improving on the success of our notable programs and services while increasing our outreach to more veterans in the city to better inform them of who we are and how to best access our services and benefits. To accomplish this, we commit ourselves to working smarter by effectively managing resources, staff, and time to deliver verifiable, evidence-based outcomes. At the heart of DVS's mission is the foundational goal of fostering purpose-driven lives for our veterans and their families, regardless of era, length of service, or discharge status. Before I go into our accomplishments and successes from this past year, I think it's important to remember DVS's origin and charter with that, I'd like to talk about Local Law 113. 
In 2015, through the hard work of the council members in front of me, the advocates before me, and the leadership of Mayor Bill de Blasio, Local Law 113 was introduced into law. The law removed the Mayor's Office of Veterans Affairs and created the Department of Veterans Services. Local Law 113 was a call to action for a group of constituents who have more than earned it for their dedication to our country. Our original charter was built upon four pillars of veteran services that create the foundation of the agency that we are now. Those pillars are education and retraining services, health, well-being, and rehabilitation, provisions and benefits across all government levels, employment and re-employment services. With these pillars in mind, I begin my testimony in continuing to evolve, understand, and serve a constituency that gives so much back. Someone once said that home is where one starts from. As I often say, without a strong foundation, the house will crumble. Since our inception, DVS has been at the forefront of finding suitable housing for homeless veterans. We've housed over 860 veterans in total in just under four years. In the first four months of fiscal year 2020, DVS housed 54% more homeless veterans than the same period last year. DVS is on pace to hit a remarkable milestone over the coming year, housing our 1,000th veteran. While these numbers show the tremendous growth, pride, and expertise found in DVS staff, it is the lives that we impact that is our greatest win. Take, for example, the story of Steve, who served in the Army. He moved here from South Carolina to build a better life for him and his son. He went through some hard times, including losing an apartment right before Christmas that he was scheduled to move into due to problems with a landlord. Through it all, he kept a cheery disposition, telling our veteran peer coordinator that he knew that we would find him a safe place soon. Shortly after that, we secured a place for him, and he moved into his new residence in Staten Island. We continue to follow up with Steve, who is ecstatic that he now has a home base from which he can take care of his family and give back to the community. Or take Sonia, an Army veteran. She had been living in a family shelter and had a tough time finding a unit for her and her, husband, her disabled son. She was lucky to get linked to a Mitchell Lama apartment and avoid a long-term wait, but unfortunately, the three apartments that she was offered had a variety of problems. We worked hard and strategically to find a suitable apartment for her and her disabled son. She was finally accepted into a beautiful apartment early last year. While Steve and Sonia's stories are only two examples, the care we provided displays DVS's unwavering commitment to finding suitable housing for veterans in need across the five boroughs. An example that shows this dedication to a larger scale is our recent Surf Vets Place, or Surf Vets Partnership, with Concern for Independent Living and Georgia Green Ventures. Surf Vets Place is a brand new building in Coney Island that not only contains supportive housing for veterans, but also serves as transition housing for those returning from military service. Through Surf Vets, we not only assist our veterans in need, but connect with those who are transitioning to provide them the supportive services and assistance to prevent isolation and further homelessness. As part of Surf Vets, we identified 82 homeless veterans for the project and helped them with apartment applications and gathering the appropriate documentation that they would need. We began moving veterans in last July and finished in December. The last veteran to move in required DVS to collaborate with NYCHA, the Bronx Mental Health Court, a veteran shelter, and the Department of Veterans Affairs. Needless to say, this was all hands on deck uh, moment that uh, our team coordinated seamlessly. And on December 30th, 2019, the veteran was successfully moved into his new home at Surfette. DVS is also making measurable strides when it comes to housing policy. Most recently, DVS and NYCHA successfully pushed for triple the allocation of VASH continuum vouchers for DVS to provide rental assistance and case management to homeless veterans who are disconnected from the VA. In receiving an additional 95 vouchers, we continue to drastically reduce the number of veterans who are homeless and begin to assist them to achieve economic success and stability. Further, through this advocacy, DVS was able to receive a long-term commitment of utilizing up to 15% of NYCHA's total VASH allotment allocation over the coming years. I'd now like to discuss a topic that is painful for this community, veteran suicide. According to the most recent data, veteran suicide deaths range between 0.3 and 0.7% of the total veteran deaths each year. Veteran status is determined using information provided on the death certificate. The informant, usually next of kin, provides personal information to the funeral director that is recorded on the death certificate. To ascertain veteran status, informants are asked if the decedent uh, ever served in the U.S. Armed Forces. It is possible that the informant may not know if the decedent served in the U.S. Armed Forces. Uh, between 2010 and 2017, the average number of suicides was 34 per year, averaging less than three per month. 
to further our efforts in understanding the issues surrounding veteran suicide in New York City. DVS, DVS and the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene entered into a memorandum of understanding to better determine the age, race, education level, contributing causes, and cause of death, among other data points, to better understand the situation aggregated uh, th through boroughs. In doing so, DVS will utilize this information to determine effective data-driven policies with the goal of reducing the number of veteran suicides in New York City. As always, we encourage any service member, veteran, or those concerned about their loved ones to call the Veterans Crisis Line at 1-800-273-8255 and press 1 to talk with someone. I'll say it again, 1-800-273-8255 and press 1 to talk with someone. Um, I'd be remiss if I didn't also acknowledge NYC Well which is the city's vehicle for helping those who are either in or tangential to mental health first aid crises. The number for NYC Well is 1-888-NYC-WELL. Also, those uh, in need can also text WELL, W-E-L-L, -L, to 65173. Once again, text WELL, W-E-L-L, -L, to 65173. Simultaneously, to help combat this epidemic, we held a crisis intercept mapping session three weeks ago in Staten Island. At this training, we brought together more than 35 individuals from 20 organizations representing medical, mental health, city, state, and federal agencies to engage in the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration training session in that borough to close gaps that will help reduce the number of veteran suicides in Richmond County. It is the first time that New York City has held such training focused on lowering veteran suicides. Further, DVS continues to explore holistic methods in healthcare, in the healthcare space. Uh, take, for example, our Veteran Insurance Collaborative, uh, the Veteran Data Initiative. Uh, through the collaborative, DVS, in conjunction with the DA, VA, Medicaid, Medicare, TRICARE, Metro Plus, and other organizations, seek to increase healthcare access for veterans, starting with affordable sh insurance. Our goal is to create one point of access to, inf uh, to information for veterans and military families about insurance eligibility for public and private insurance, as well as VA eligibility. Our data initiative is a coalition between DVS, New York City Health and Hospitals, and CIDI, whose intent is to explore data in regards to constituent access to insurance, care, and housing. It is through these data-driven approaches that DVS can effectively shine light on the issue and lead in its solution. DVS is also committed to ensuring veterans and their families are aware of and have access to non-traditional mental health services. Since launching Vet Connect NYC, providers such as the David Lynch Foundation, Sierra Club Military Outdoors, and most recently, Gallup NYC and Catholic Charities have joined, or are in the process of joining the network, enabling our veterans to access uh, meditation, equine therapy, outdoor group activities, caregiver, respite, and substance abuse support group services. We continue to work with our partners at the Institute for Veterans and Military Families to be certain that this platform evolves based on community needs, opportunities, and strengths. In addition, Thrive NYC has been a strong partner in addressing the mental health gaps and issues facing veterans throughout New York City. Addressing mental health needs is a citywide commitment whereby advocates, agencies, nonprofits, and elected officials work together in the pursuit of enhancing mental health support and addressing the mental health needs of our veterans and fellow New Yorkers. Between January 1, 2017 and December 31, 2019, over 29,000 veterans, military families, and caregivers were engaged through the Vets Thrive NYC program. Through our engagement community services staff, DVS works to connect individuals, individuals with social service and mental health resources. Our outreach efforts also include spreading the word about Vet Connect NYC, uh, mental health first aid training, the Columbia Protocol for Suicide Prevention, NYC Well, and veteran competency training. Further, through the reconfiguration uh, of the, a demographic versus ge geographic approach, we anticipate greater engagement with our constituency. Lastly, as we take care of our veterans in life, we must also be there for them in passing. In partnership with our sister agencies, DVS stands as a model for providing the care and humane burials for our fellow warriors. On average, DVS ensures the proper burial of approximately 85 veterans per year. Through these efforts by our dedicated DVS staff, DVS continues to provide the support and services across a variety of veteran issues and needs. As DVS continues to build on its success and expand services for our most vulnerable veterans, we are also broadening our efforts to move our community to a higher place of well-being and professional success. Last fall, DVS launched the first ever employee mentorship program for veterans and AmeriCorps alumni called Service to Service. Through this program, service-minded New Yorkers are paired with city employee mentors to learn the intricacies of city government employment. Service to Service also includes educational workshop programming about professional careers in NYC government. As of the end of January, 
Over 30 individuals have been paired with mentors from departments such as Small Business Services, FDNY, the Department of Transportation, NYCHA, and the Public Advocate's Office. We recently heard from one service service veteran who participated, who shared the following comment with us about the program. You did a wonderful job pairing me with my city mentor. We either email or text almost every day, and she has diligently been sending me job postings. She's also revised my resume. In addition to services to service, DVS has experienced favorable outcomes with Veterans Care, a pay-for-success initiative that improves city employment outcomes for veterans with surface-connected PTSD. Presently, over 70 veterans spanning different wars, genders, and races have been enrolled in the program. So far, 22 have found full-time employment in companies such as Amazon and Warby Parker and fields that range from government to logistics. One such veteran who entered the program is Mike, a U.S. Army Gulf War veteran who suffered from PTSD and was struggling at his job. He was bullied by his coworkers and referred to as the, the PTSD veteran. His work atmosphere was loud and unforgiving, so he sought help from Veterans Care. The project matched Mike with an employment specialist who helped him identify suitable job opportunities that matched his interests, skills, and disability needs. Thanks to Veterans Care, Mike landed a job with a federal agency in a role that will continue his pension and will aid in his mental health recovery. Veterans Care has been a pathway to the middle class for Mike and so many others in programs like this, strengthen the agency's goal of economic empowerment and wellness for our veterans and their families. We all know a successful career starts with solid education. That's why DVS committed to ensuring the administrators at the schools with the largest student veteran populations have an established point of contact with our agency. By bringing together these administrators who are essentially the boots on the ground, DVS is positioned to disseminate crucial information and resources down to the student veteran population. The veterans on camp, through Veterans on Campus, DVS has created a direct line of contact between our staff and the schools, enabling us to support and problem solve in real time, such as when uh, VA basic allowance for housing payments were delayed in the fall of 2018 and our students were in need of rental assistance. In addition, just this past January, thanks to a grant that we received secured through the Mayor's Fund, our Veterans on Campus initiative sponsored 17 CUNY student veteran leaders, one from each undergraduate institution, to attend the Student Veterans of America's National Conference in Los Angeles. The SVA 17, as they are now fondly referred to by the CUNY Office of Veterans Affairs, learned about on-campus chapter development, best practices, uh, employment opportunities, mental health resources, and advocacy, both at the government and academic levels. The SVA 17 continue to build upon the relationship they forged at the conference, bringing together their schools and campus chapters in a new unpre and unprecedented ways. In fact, the students are even exploring the creation of a university-wide CUNY Student Veterans of America chapter that would unite. I'm pleased to share that the, pos the PO Posse uh, Veterans Program has recently become a part of the Vet Connect NYC platform. Um, the Posse Veterans Program identifies, trains, and supports veterans of the U.S. Armed Forces interested in pursuing bachelor's degrees at the top colleges and universities. Participants receive training prior to matriculating on campus and mentoring once enrolled. In addition, Posse Partner Colleges provide veterans in the program with supplemental funding to cover the full cost of tuition. We're always open to new collaborations and ideas that will help veterans on campus further reach, serve, and empower our student veteran population. In order to provide better service, benefits and services, we must first be able to engage and interact with our constituents. As many of you know, our constituency is getting older and our veteran population is getting smaller. Right now, over 70% of our population are 55 or, over, or older. As our World War II, Korean, and Vietnam veterans continue to age, unless young people join the military, that population will continue to decrease. To that end, DVS held its first partnership convening event on February 6, 2020, to hear firsthand how we can build stronger bonds with our veteran community and expand our outreach. Uh, I see many familiar faces here on the council and in the audience that were there. The event was attended by more than 160 people from over 75 different organizations, and it is the first step in what I consider to be a listening tour to better inform us so that we can provide the most value to our veterans and to the veteran community, as well as bring new veterans into the fold. We've already been examining the comments and suggestions that were returned to us, and I look forward to hearing more ideas from the veteran community in the days ahead. Next, to better interact with our constituents and notify them of their benefits, DVS has shifted our outreach program from approach from geographical to demographic. While we will maintain our presence within each borough, our engagement staff has undergone a restructuring to better care for those who have served based on their unique attributes. Under this restructuring, DVS staff will oversee portfolios focused on demographic categories such as women and LGBTQ veterans, students and those presently serving, as well as the elderly, caregivers, survivors, and spouses. 
Through this restructuring, we hope to better engage with organizations, players, and key community leaders to foster ongoing relationships and better reach our constituency. DVS also seeks to increase the number of veterans with access to benefits across all levels. It is estimated that approximately 10% of the over 210,000 veterans living in New York City hold a less than honorable discharge status. Spread across all wartime eras, discharges under dishonorable conditions have prevented many veterans from concluding their service with pride and receiving benefits afforded on behalf of their service. While DVS serves all veterans regardless of discharge, we seek to more effectively address, include, and engage all pockets of our constituency. Because of this, DVS has been hard at work drafting a negotiated acquisition to award $1.7 million over three years to nonprofit legal organizations to address the growing backlog of discharge cases. In doing so, we hope to not only remove that backlog, but to return the recognition these veterans deserve. Known as the Discharge Upgrade Assistance Legal Services, or DUALS, program, DVS and the City of New York continue to address the issues facing thousands of New York City veterans. Also, while we continue to discuss a strategic plan for the functionality of a contract shop, DBS has begun a search for a director of contracts. In this role, the director of contracts will serve as a subject matter expert for already existing contracts, such as VetConnect NYC, and pay for success, all while leading the agency's expansion into contracts like duels. Furthermore, as we move forward, the director of contracts will serve as the subject matter lead in determining the potential of being an agency for discretionary contracts. Working hand in hand with our ombudsman, this director of contracts will lift some of the contracts raised by our constituents and allow us to further engage our people with the help that they deserve. As we continue to improve and refine our agency direction and fill the remaining roles, I am certain that our committed and talented staff will engage more of our constituency and assist in providing them with the many services that they have earned. Uh, in conclusion, as DVS expands its programs and services to better address the needs and concerns of our veteran community, I am certain that we will continue to stand as the national model for years to come. Moving into this next fiscal year, we hope to continue our tradition of improving with each day to better serve our constituents and the issues they face. We thank you for the opportunity to testify on this matter, and we look forward to any questions you or any other member of the committee may have. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Commissioner. Thanks for the very detailed uh, testimony. Uh, so I want to ask, first I, I want to recognize uh, we were joined by Councilmember Matthew Eugene, we are also joined by Councilmember Paul Vallone. So I know that, that there, is, there is another hearing uh, in, at City Hall with the Department of Health in regards to uh, the coronavirus uh, issue. So I'm going to ask my colleagues first to, to see if they have any questions. Any questions? Um, I don't have a question, but I'm excited about the search for the Director of Contracts. I just wanted to say that. Great. Okay. And I just want to say, Commissioner, thank you for you and your team coming out to our office, hearing about Northeast Queens veterans' ideas throughout the city and the borough. It's big steps, and we look forward to working with you and your team. So thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you. Uh, so in the fiscal year 2021 preliminary budget um, allocates 49 full-time positions to departments, uh, and as of this month, only 38 positions have been filled. So what is the department's plan to fill the remaining uh, vacancies? Uh, Mr. Chair, I just want to uh, clarify. What I'm tracking is it's 49 authorized positions. Uh, 39 have been filled uh, as of this hearing. And our plan is to fill these at a rate of two per quarter, beginning with this, fiscal, with this particular quarter. So we should see two uh, added uh, as far as hires made, you know, really, you know, before the end of this month, before the end of Q3 of this fiscal year. And then you'll see another two made in the next quarter and so on and so forth. The next two to be made will be our Director of Housing Services and our Veteran Peer Coordinator. Um, and then in the following quarter, one will be that Director of, House, uh, Director of Contract Services and then another one uh, yet to be identified. So, um, you know, before we discuss the, uh, any specific, uh, any more specific questions about the budget, are there any new needs in the department uh, requested from OMB and did not receive funding in, uh, for in the preliminary budget? So right now we're in ongoing conversations with OMB uh, as far as, you know, uh, different needs, et cetera. I just want to highlight that, uh, you know, that's still an ongoing process, but since the last budget hearing, we did have two positions that were filled, and we thank the council for its advocacy there. I'm talking about a program manager position and a community coordinator position between last year's budget hearing and this year's hearing. So, yes. Okay. In, uh, in fiscal year 2019, the department had a budget of $5.1 million, and, but only spent approximately $4.1 uh, million of its budget. And for fiscal year 2020, the department's budget increased slightly to $5.4 uh, million at adoption 
and is at 6.1 million as of the fiscal year 2021 20, uh, preliminary budget. The department's budget continues to grow to 6.7 million fiscal year uh, 2021. So can you explain why the department didn't spend its entire budget? It comes back to us uh, not filling all those vacancies. So if we were to fill all the vacancies, then we would max out as far as the personnel services, that, that money that is accounted for there. So that, that difference is for the uh, vacancies that weren't mm -hmm. filled? That is correct, Mr. Chair. That's everything. Um, and why did, the, why did the department's budget increase this year and uh, if it didn't spend the so when last this year. goes back to the, the idea of like the two lines, for instance, and when we had the, the two lines that thanks to your advocacy we were able to add as far as that community coordinator and that program manager, so that therefore increases the amount that we have for personnel support, but we still are closing this delta as far as uh, filling vacancies. And then the other piece of it, forgive me, I'll, 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 yeah, I want to defer to Cass on this, because there's personnel services aspect of it, then there's the uh, other than personnel service aspect of it. That other than personnel service aspect of it, that's two contracts that we are currently um, you know, working through. And I'll, I'll defer to uh, Cassandra on that. Thank you for the question, uh, Chair Deitch. Um, so the contracts that we have active right now are Vet Connect NYC and the Veterans Care contract. Um, as far as increased funding in our FY21 budget, we'll also be seeing funding for um, the legal services that uh, the commissioner referenced in his testimony, um, in addition to the non-traditional uh, uh, medical services, which is our partnership with Thrive. Um, got it. Okay. Does, does the um, department anticipate underspending this coming fiscal year? I think we're on a glide path right now to keep the hiring plan of two per quarter right now. So for us, it's really to continue to, to meet that piece of it. Uh, I, I'm worried about saying whether we'll underspend or not, because for us, it's really about being thoughtful with whom we're bringing on. I think the director of contracts is a perfect example of something where we took a hard look at the vacancies and said, this is the smartest thing to do with this vacancy. So we will continue to be thoughtful with whom we are onboarding, Mr. Chair. And what happens with the, the balance of the difference that uh, DBS underspends? You know, I'm, I'm going to have to get back to you on that as far as what happens with the balance. Okay. Uh, the administration re recently provided us a breakdown of a Thrive NYC funding. Uh, and it, it, it included $800,000 and a budgeted headcount for mental health services. Uh, 600000 uh, was is dedicated towards men mental health outreach and support for veterans while another $200,000 is for non-traditional mental health services for veterans. Now, is this funding on top of the existing $600,000 for mental health services in DBS's budget? I'll have to get back to you to confirm that. Yeah. Uh Yep, you, yeah. yeah, thank you for the question, Chair. So um, the $600,000 is m intended to cover uh, the outreach staff, and Jason can speak more to that. And then the 200000 is to uh, cover the, uh, the non-traditional mental health services. So it's it's the it's not additional. That's, that's what the number so is. It's within, so sorry, just to clarify, yeah. So it's, it is within the numbers that you're seeing right now. So yeah. So it's within it's the numbers. Within, yeah. So what do you say, Jason? Yes. Could if you yeah. yeah, you want to? Yeah, thank you, Council. Okay, go ahead. Um, there are 15 constituent facing outreach roles, and their roles are, are of, to focus including on housing and engagement. Within those eight lines, within those 15 constituent uh, facing outreach roles, eight of those lines are funded by Thrive. Eight of those are funded by Thrive, okay. Now, does the department anticipate any problems delivering all of these services with, um, with a smaller staff? I'm sorry, I don't, I don't understand the question. So you, your, your count is, um, you're under counted when it comes to, you don't have the entire uh, 49 people working uh, for DBS. Mm -hmm. So um, based on what you anticipate, um, and bringing services to the veterans, do you feel that you'll be doing a lot less um, services to veterans with less staff? 
will this affect the way DBS does the work? I think it's nuanced because we've, you know, it, it's not that we were at a point of having 49 filled and that we lost them at any point. It's that as a new agency, we've had these new lines that we've received. So, you know, right now with the 39 full-time employees, we're, this is about what we've been at. So we're continuing to grow. So it's the other side of it in that we see ourselves actually being able to provide much more thoughtful and expanded services. And this is why we're just very careful with what we're doing with each of these as we're filling them. Um, slow is smooth and smooth is fast is something we say in the military. That's how we're trying to approach this. Okay. Uh, recently, the administration stated they helped provide mental health services to over 20,000 veterans in New York City uh, through Thrive NYC. However, close examination of the numbers suggests this figure is combining of um, the value from the, PP, the PMMR of veterans and families that DBS's outreach team has engaged over the last three fiscal years. Uh, how was this number uh, derived? Um, how did you get to this number? So when we look at the, and I'll start and then Jason will finish it off, when we look at the Thrive numbers, it's, yeah, two, piece, two different pieces of it are reported. One of them is, you know, number of our constituents who we've engaged since Thrive's inception, which is where that 29,000 number comes from. The other one okay. is, of those whom we've engaged, how many have we helped normalize help-seeking behavior with? And that's where the other number, I always say 8383, 8,338 uh, have come from. 8,383, excuse me, 8383 has come from. So you want to add any? I just want to add that, that uh, these folks are, are folks that we've informed or assisted. So um, as you know, uh, Councilman, our outreach staff takes uh, a whole health view on all of our outreach where we uh, not only refer them to uh, their, their needs when it comes to uh, mental health community resources, uh, but we also take a, an encompassing approach to the veteran where we help them with housing or employment. and. Uh, when doing so, we have to better identify their needs so we can engage with them on several different things uh, along with mental health. Thank you. Um, first of all, I just want to tell you, Commissioner, I want to thank you for um, your work and uh, in collaboration also on the hearings we had in the past in regards to veteran suicide. Um, and uh, you did mention in your testimony how you're going to work with the medical examiner. So that is extremely, extremely important. And to further bring out the, the necessary resources uh, to those veterans. And this is something uh, I just want to say. I want to say for the record that I commend you for and, uh, and, and also um, how you partner with, that, with the committee, with the Veterans Committee. So that's a step in, in uh, the right direction. So I want to say thank you. Uh, for your partnership in this, and we're looking to do great things uh, this coming this coming year. So I want to thank you for that. Um, in uh, in 2006, the department conducted a census of how many veterans uh, live in uh, New York City by borough. In 2016, it estimates the estimates suggested that there are approximately 210,000 veterans in New York City. Uh, this January, the New York State Division of Veterans Affairs released a report estimating that the New York City veteran population was at about 165,000, which is roughly 55,000 less than the census uh, DBS released nearly five years ago. So are these numbers methodologically differences um, that would explain the, the discrepancy between the studies? Yeah, I, I want to clarify. Um, that number doesn't include people like me who's a reservist, who's currently drilling. And so the delta is really those who are guardsmen, those who are reservists, and those who are active duty who live in New York City. And that's the reason for the difference. Uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, how does the department currently estimate the number of veterans in New York City? We'll have to get back to with the details. I know that we use VetPOP as uh, a source for it as far as data, which is something that's made available through the VA. But we can get back to with more details on how we break that out, Mr. Chair. Uh, and what steps has the department taken to work with the state or the federal veterans administration to ensure that there is an accurate count? And w what are your plans in, in the future to make sure we have a more accurate count on New York City veterans? We'll get back to with a thorough plan, but I know I've been uh, really thick, uh, you know, tied at the hip with my counterpart at the state level, Jim McDonough, as we've discussed these and other issues as far as what the plan will be for this type of outreach. But we'll get back to you with a more thorough response there, sir. Thank you. Taking notes, right? <laughs> okay. Um, uh, what does DVS uh, do when a veteran or family member expresses a mental health need, and what is the process? I know you mentioned uh, there was a number. You 
you mentioned two numbers. Uh, oh, yeah, you got the, so the, the VA has its own uh, veteran crisis number. That, uh, was was that the number that, that's? That was one of, that, that's in the testimony. And the other one I said was the NYC well for those who are local in New York City as far as two things that are in real time. But I wanted to defer to Jason on, uh, on this piece. Yeah. Council, um, our outreach staff, for those folks that do claim that they need mental health services, uh, provide direct assistance and and how that works is that in many cases the referral is made through VetConnect or made directly to the, our mental health partners uh, that are members of the VetConnect platform. Um, I have to add a lot of this stuff yeah. is, is uh, it in the course of having a relationship with someone you're assisting uh, as one of our community coordinators, things come up and we do what we can to help them. Each case is so unique. You could be, on one hand, dealing with someone whose uh, husband just passed away and that husband was a veteran and counseling them. On the other hand, you could be, have met someone who's at uh, Board and Avenue, Avenue at the shelter uh, for veterans and just assisting them with getting housing. And Oh, then you could have just met someone at a local veterans event and they talk to you about an employment issue. It comes in so many different ways. I just want to highlight that, Mr. Chair. Yeah. Thank you. Um, let's talk about uh, veteran homelessness. Uh, first of all, the, that number you gave me for that 888 number, did we ever try calling that number and pushing one? Oh, for the Veterans Crisis yeah. Center? Um, I will get back to I personally have not dialed it and pushed one. Uh, I know that we've had someone on the staff who has dialed it and pushed one. And I'm, I'm certain that 888 NYC Well also is a good look as far as... And you got, you got a live person on the Yeah, and I, and I want to mention this too. This came up uh, when we had our crisis intercept mapping session back in Staten Island a few weeks ago. This was a topic that came up as far as this thing work, And that's why I just bring that out as someone having said it there from the VA. Okay, so I had my staff um, call up that number and mm -hmm. someone answered within 45 seconds. So that was good. Thank you. Uh, can you uh, s specify, um, let's talk about homeless vet, uh, veteran homelessness. How many veterans are estimated to be homeless in New York City and, and how many are located in shelters? So right now, um, as of the point in time count, uh, which is you know tied to the uh, what we report annually on this at the federal level, the point in time count is 684 as far as those who are in shelters. And then those who we believe are street homeless, that number is six right now, Mr. Chair. So six street homeless, and do we know exactly where, who they are and where they are? Yes, Mr. Chair. Um, and uh, based on your, I mean, who does your outreach to those six individuals? So this falls under our veteran peer coordinator team, which is under our housing and security services line, as far as the folks we have who handle that piece of the outreach. So, yeah. so which and borough are these six? Yeah. I'm sorry, defer to Jason. Yeah, sure. Oh, well, Council, I just want to um, add there that we work in conjunction with the Department of Homeless Services on street outreach. Uh, they have a specific unit for veteran street, uh, veteran street homeless population, and most of the time we work in conjunction with them because they have the resources to be out in the field uh, with their vans to identify these folks. So if you only have uh, six, six people living in the street who are, are veterans, do we know, uh, number one, what borough they're from and what the reasons are that they they um, not going into shelter? Council, uh, we don't have that information on us, but we can we can follow up with we you. With we, we know exactly where to get it, so we yeah. can, you know, on okay. each of these. Yeah. So I just want to uh, ask you, Commissioner, if you want, I'll go out with you. We can go visit those six mm -hmm. homeless veterans and let's find out why they don't want to go into shelter and mm -hmm. see if we can get them off the street. Mm -hmm. I absolutely look forward to it. I mean, someone who did the Hope Count adjacent to your district, not yeah. district adjacent to it, you know I'm completely with you on that. We'll take the train. I don't have a car. <laughs> that sounds good, Mr. Chair. That sounds good. Um, so the 684, um, do you know what shelters, that is that the Borden Avenue shelter? The 684 homeless people that Mr. are Council. actually. Council, the majority of them uh, do. That's what he says. The majority of them are in Borden Avenue, but Borden Avenue doesn't single-handedly have the, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the space for all 684. So the majority of them are in Borden, and then the rest of them are scattered throughout other shelters. Um, so you did mention uh, that you put in over 80 veterans in uh, Coney Island in the surf, the surf housing. Mm -hmm. So um, the count is at 684 who uh, 
remaining who still need housing, who still need permanent housing. So where do these people, where, where do they, where do these veterans uh, come from? Because I know that last year I think the number was at 500 and something. So we, we keep on taking veterans out of the shelter and we have new, we have more veterans coming in. So do we have, do we know where they're coming from? Like what states? Chair, I would, I would say that uh, we would have to engage with DHS uh, because their, their intake process and, and a tracking system that we utilize to collect that information uh, is run by them. But we would be happy to bring that information back to you. Also, I want to point out this is another example where it's no mistake that this month we're bringing on a director of housing services and an additional veteran peer coordinator to continue to attack this problem. Mr. Chair. So is that something you're looking to um, take a look at, to, to, have, uh, to have those figures? Sure. You feel it's important to have those figures to see where they're coming from? Because I know the mayor just announced that he wants to reconnect um, uh, people who are homeless, who are in homeless shelters, to family members. So is that part of um, the mayor's announcements to, to reconnect uh, homeless veterans? I can't speak to um, the mayor's announcements. Uh, on, on connecting those folks. But I know that our aftercare unit uh, spends a significant amount of time analyzing information on where these homeless veterans uh, originated from. And should, they also spend a significant amount of time ensuring that those folks stay in their home. Uh, so every area that we can collect data at, that you're referencing makes us smarter and, and more efficient in doing our job. And this goes to something I said during the last hearing too, Mr. Chair, in that it's important to us to uh, provide value to the entire bell curve of our veterans. So if we focus on the entire bell curve, we can ideally catch more folks before they slip into housing insecurity. And that's why it's so important to have this demographic approach to things, to be able to get in front of folks and get the word out that we are here and that we can help and connect them with different services, do whatever we can um, to you know, make sure that we try to preempt these situations. So when, when, the, when the mayor makes an announcement about homeless, um, homelessness, now, the veteran homeless population is part of that population as well. So doesn't DHS, I mean, if the mayor makes an announcement, obviously DHS knows about it. So there's no um, conversation that you had over the last few weeks since the mayor's announcement with DHS in regards to the mayor's future plan on reducing, I think he had a uh, five-year plan on reducing uh, homelessness. We have not yet, but, but we, we look forward to uh, determining a viable plan to work with them to, to ensure that that gets executed. Also, coordination like this is one of those things that our Director of Housing Services will tackle head on as well, back to whom we're putting on the team and what we see them doing so we can make sure that we are all hands on deck with this, Mr. Chair. So uh, in fiscal year 2020, the city allocated $40 million to perform census outreach, uh, outreach ahead of this year's enumeration uh, with the objective of improving New York City's historically low self-response uh, rate. Uh, this, will be, uh, this will be is achieved by equipping the public, especially those in historically undercounted communities, with accurate information about the census and how they can be counted. As part of the city's plan to ensure complete counts, city agencies are asked to partner in the get out the count drive by either forming a plan of their own or by incorporating census outreach into the, in their existing programs uh, and or services. Has DVS created a get out the count plan in collaboration with the New York City Census uh, 2020? We'll have to get back to you on that, Mr. Chair. I know that we're um, very much in support of what the mayor's office is doing, specific to census outreach, and that we've gone out of our way at uh, prior veteran advisory board hearing to make sure that someone who is representative, a veteran from the census, uh, on the outreach side was able to speak so that the veteran community could know, make sure you stand to be counted. Okay, I just want to go with some uh, questions uh, from the January hearing. Um, so. Uh, I think we already went over what is the current uh, uh, veteran suicide rate, which I, I want to thank you, and I'm looking forward to working with you on that. Uh, how many veterans uh, receive services from uh, Vet Drive NYC? I think that was a question that wasn't able. It wasn't. I'm sorry. Was, did, is this a what we just covered as far as the, uh, 8,383? 
number. So I think it's 8,383. Yeah. 8,300. Yeah. 83, 83. And 83. Sure. So that's how many veterans receive services through yes. uh, Project NYC. Mm-hmm. Um, how many veteran evictions have occurred in the following years, 2017, 18, 19, and uh, 20? We'll get back to you on the eventions information. I just want to comment something that uh, you've mentioned, you know, both you know, in the hearing and outside of the hearing, uh, was this issue of, uh, heaven forbid, if a, a veteran um, passes away and they're in support of housing, um, how do we make sure that that vacancy can be filled right away with another veteran in need of housing? And I just wanted to, you know, report that uh, there are two different measures we're taking to tackle this issue. One is on the aftercare piece of this, uh, and another is on the actual housing specialist piece. So for our housing specialist, we've uh, directed her to uh, make sure that when you're reaching out to landlords and asking them to accept our people who are receiving the HUD-VASH vouchers, that you report to us if there are any issues where, heaven forbid, that, that tenant passes away so we can be notified right away. On the aftercare side, we've asked our aftercare coordinator to do something similar. Aftercare is responsible for tying in with the veterans who are currently in place, so to make sure that not only the people whom she's working with, but their families know, and that the landlord who's existing in the system knows. We want to do what we can to shorten the timeline through which um, someone who's receiving supportive housing, that housing becomes available, that it can be made available to the next veteran. So thank you so much, Mr. Chair, for your leadership there. Thank you. And you have uh, 684 uh, homeless veterans. So that's, I want to go back to the same question as the um, discussion that we just had before with the 684. So if we could just take a look at that to see how many of those veterans, you know, uh, uh, transitioned from another state coming into New York City and how many uh, end up at the shelter because of, of an eviction. So is that something that, is that information that you could get? I mean, when we'll, veterans... We'll, we'll look into it and get when, back to When them, veterans yeah. come into the shelter, they obviously they have to, they put in some type of information. Um, we we'll look into it. I don't want to speak out of time. I want to make sure we've done our homework on this, but to back brief, I'm tracking the idea of, of the 684, how many are folks transitioning from another state? How many of these are folks with an eviction situation? Okay. Great, okay. Um, so once you uh, identify a veteran uh, at the Borden Avenue or homeless shelter, uh, how, long it ta- how, how long does it take them to place uh, the veteran into, into housing? Like, what is the process and what is the timeline of that? Uh, Council, we, we uh, get that, that individual out under 90 days, but uh, every case is unique. Okay. All right, so um, I'm going to conclude this. I'm also going to run across the street after the hearing. <clears throat> so I also want to ask you if it's possible if you could stick around because we have about eight people testifying. So I just wanted to know if you could stick around just to hear those, um, the people that came, took the time to, to be here today to testify, if you don't mind. Yeah, I, I, our, our team will be definitely make sure we have someone here to listen right. to those testimonies. Okay, thank you. Sure. thank you. All right, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
next Monday. Okay. Uh, Joe Vitti. Uh, Ryan, uh, Ryan Foley from NILAG. Uh, Aston Stewart. A man Kraus. And uh, Coco. Come on. We're going to try to get five people up there at a time. Just squeeze them. We have the three mics, so we'll just take turns. And we're joined by Councilmember Alan Maisel. Alan, you have a question? Anybody have an answer? All right, we'll go clockwise. We'll start with you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Sorry about that. Good afternoon, Chair Drom, Chair Deutsch, and members of the New York City Council Committee on the Veterans. My name is Joe Vitti. I'm the supervisor of the, vet of the Veterans Program for VNSNY, Visiting Nurse Service of New York. I served at, in the Army as a Battalion Intelligence Officer for a Field Artillery Unit. I want to thank you all for the opportunity to testify and speak about VNSNY's Veterans Outreach Program, for which we request $150,000 in Council funding. Venus and Y is the largest not-for-profit, home and community-based healthcare organization in the U.S., providing care to more, to more than 44,000 patients and health plan members every day. We began serving immigrants on the Lower East Side who were shunned by traditional medical institutions, and since then we have continuously provided critical home and community-based healthcare services to marginalized populations. Our hospice is now the eighth largest in the U.S. and the largest hospice provider to veterans in New York State. Last year in 2019, we conducted 876 veteran patient admissions. We are, <clears throat> Venus and Weiss Hospice is a, is a level five, the highest level, for the We Honor Veterans Program that is led and collaborated by the National Hospice and Palliative Care Organization and the Department of Veteran Affairs. And this recognition <clears throat> uh, recognizes a high level of care to veterans and expertise in VA health care and benefits, their, its execution, and the education on the population's needs that provide culturally sensitive care. We are also proud to be a community contract, a, a community care network provider under the newly implemented VA Mission Act and one of the preferred vendors for our uh, VA hospitals here in New York City, including the New York State Veterans Home at St. Albans. Of the approximate 22.5 million veterans in America today, 18 million are over the age of 65, where approximately 25% of all the deaths that take place in the U.S. today are veterans. That's approximately 1,600 veterans every day. And 96% of all those deaths are occurring in our community, with the 4% occurring in a VA facility of some sort. So <clears throat> with the, with this community has a diverse and complex physical and mental, health, and mental health needs that the VA addresses with a multitude of services and benefits. However, because of the complexity of the VA system and systemic poor health literacy among veterans, many veterans never fully access nor utilize the benefits that they deserve. As New York City's veterans population continues to get older, we we have seen that of our pay, of our 876 patients, 20 approximately 26 percent of them are World War II, 20 percent are from are, are Korean War veterans, 18 percent are Vietnam, and approximately 36 percent composed of the other war eras, peacetime, uh, Cold War, OIF, OEF, etc. So it is becoming more important to conduct this outreach so that they know about their full VA benefits, which can, which can cover home care, hospice, and long-term care services. Our, our outreach program currently has three veterans liaisons that serve all five boroughs, with most of our veteran patients coming from Manhattan, Queens, and then Brooklyn. With this request of $150,000 in city funding, we wish to expand the Vienna Visit and Nurse Service of New York's hospice program to serve more, than, to serve more veterans throughout New York City. <clears throat> we have implemented cultural sensitivity training for our staff, as well within our healthcare informatic, informatic practices. 
This collection of data has enabled us to assess areas of opportunity to help address the veterans in our community. It helps us to see the current health landscape for veterans in New York and to ensure positive patient experiences during this era of value-based care. This funding, of, uh, th this funding will support additional staff resources with a focus in Brooklyn specifically to help with one, educate and improve New York City veterans and community access to their VA benefits, two, expand our partnerships with veterans, hospitals, and groups, and three, provide education to community-based organizations and providers for veterans' special needs at end-of-life care. A quick patient story would be uh, up, up, up in the Bronx this past uh, Veterans Day, you, you, there's a, in the testimony, we have a reference to it, it was covered in the news. Uh, we veterans have a approximately 70% higher chance than non-service members to develop ALS, and we had a patient up in up in the Bronx who was referred to us from the Bronx VA. He was a Marine during Desert Storm, suffering from ALS, unfortunately, and who had trouble accessing some additional support service while under hospice care for his for his wife, and they were having trouble accessing these survivor benefits and struggling to know how his family was going to survive following his passing. Our, one of our liaisons up there, Ms. Sung Yoon, she's an Army uh, veteran uh, and served as a medic in Afghanistan. She was, she was so invaluable to this case where she helped this patient and the family access these benefits and, and help alleviate that stress. So when this patient was able to access all these benefits that they had encountered th throughout the years. So while in our hospice service, they got the care, but they also got access to these additional resources that we were able to provide this education internally to. So um, in closing, I would really like to thank all of you up here for strategizing and trying to formulate with all of our community partners and our city partners and how we can better serve our veterans here in New York City. And I look forward to working with all of you. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. That was a very passionate speech. I appreciate it. Thank you, Joe. Uh, and uh, so I, I know you put in an application for funding, so we're going to take a look at that. I appreciate yeah, it. Thank, thank you so much, much, sir. And I didn't know about that ALS, um, that uh, veterans are more prone to. Yes, sir. Um, you know, there's, there's uh, there, the, the DOD and the Department of Veteran Affairs, they're still researching it. There's two speculations as to why it's occurring. Uh, some of it is... Uh, one of the speculations, again, none of this is, is concluded yet. One of the speculations is how they administer uh, the immunizations to us when you go to boot camp or basic training or officer candidate school. Uh, and then, and how you immediately go into physical and mental, uh, you know, stressful activities after you get those shots. And then the second one is the lifestyle. Uh, you know, when I was in, many of us here were obviously in the military and you're averaging, what, four or five hours sleep a night, if that. <laughs> and then you're doing very physical and, and mental stressful things as well. So you're doing that for a few years. So they're thinking that that's also um, uh, another factor of why they're developing ALS. So as soon as, soon as a veteran has ALS, uh, even if that second di person did one second of, of military service in the guard or reserve or active duty, they're eligible for substantial VA benefits. And this is only one example of, 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 of an area that many veterans are not aware of. So we help them access that. It's, a ter it's obviously a very terrible disease. And during that time with healthcare being the number one reason for bankruptcy in America, uh, this is one area of, of, of population health that we seek to uh, mitigate. Do we know how many veterans here in New York City uh, have ALS? I'm sorry, what was that? We don't have any veterans um, who live here in New York City. I can certainly run a report. Um, you know, that's part of the data keeping that we, that, that we track X amount of, you know, this, of this veteran uh, population that have ALS, cancer, or um, Parkinson's, X, Y, and Z. So I can certainly find that information if you would think that would be valuable for yeah, you. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah. Yes, sir. Thanks, Chuck. Chair Deutsch, council members and staff, good afternoon and thank you for this opportunity to speak to the Veterans Committee about the fiscal year 2021 budget. My name is Ryan Foley and I am the supervising attorney of the Veterans Practice at New York Legal Assistance Group, NILAG, a nonprofit law office dedicated to providing free legal services and civil matters to low-income New Yorkers. Understanding the unique needs and challenges that exist among the diverse group of veterans that call New York City home, NILAG operates two veteran-specific programs. 
NILAG's Legal Health Veterans Initiative holds weekly legal clinics within the Bronx and Manhattan VA Medical Centers, as well as the Northport VA on Long Island. These clinics provide an opportunity for NILAG attorneys to work closely with medical professionals to address the non-medical needs of low-income veterans with serious health problems. In addition to the medical legal partnership uh, NILAG has with the Department of Veteran Affairs, we also have a community-based veteran program. NILAG's Veterans Practice, which is funded by the City Council's Legal Services for Veterans Initiative, pro provides comprehensive services to veterans and their families, regardless of whether they use or can use the VA healthcare system. With only 30% of veterans seeking care from a VA medical facility and approximately 15% of veterans receiving a less than honorable discharge, which can impact eligibility for VA health care access, NILAG's Veterans Practice looks to reach this large population of underserved veterans by working with other agencies and community-based organizations focused on assisting veterans. NILAG's Veterans Practice has close referral relationships with dozens of non-VA organizations and offices of elected officials. We are a network provider within VetConnect NYC, and we accept direct referrals through phone and email requests. Recognizing that it can be very difficult for individuals to seek help, especially veterans, NILAG provides multiple avenues to receive that request and answer the call. Veterans deal with all the same legal issues as civilians, but also run into issues unique to their veteran status. Both of NILAG's veterans programs place their main focus on those veteran-specific issues, but legal issues rarely fall neatly into one category. This makes NILAG's team of nearly 300 attorneys, paralegals, and financial counselors a powerful resource for every veteran we touch. A veteran seeking help accessing medical care will not only be screened for VA health care eligibility, but also for Medicaid and Medicare, which are crucial to obtaining long-term care for New York City's aging veteran population. A veteran seeking help with an eviction will work with attorneys who have been provided trainings not only on housing benefits specific to veterans, but also on military and veteran cultural competency. And veterans seeking help obtaining VA disability benefits are screened for all available public benefits, including Social Security and SNAP benefits, to ensure they are receiving all the resources they are entitled to. It is this combination of experienced veteran attorneys both inside the VA and in the community working within a large and knowledgeable organization dedicated to social justice which enables NILAG to pr provide the highest quality assistance to the veteran population. The crucial and comprehensive work that NILAG does on behalf of veterans would not be possible without the Legal Services for Veteran Initiative funding. As such, NILAG strongly urges the Council to continue and expand the Legal Services for Veterans Initiative to allow us to help even more New York City veterans. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. Uh, we look forward to engaging in any further discussions about serving our veteran community and improving their access to critical legal services and other resources. I would be happy to answer any questions. Good afternoon. Um, thank you, Chair Deutsch, members of the Committee on Veterans, um, advocates and allies uh, for holding this hearing focused on veteran services. My name is Ashton Stewart and I'm the program manager for SAGE Vets. SAGE is the country's first and largest organization dedicated to improving lives of lesbian, gay, bisexual and transgender older people. Founded in New York City in 1978, SAGE has provided comprehensive social services and programs to LGBT older people for four decades. SAGE Vets is one of SAGE's programs and in fact is the only program in New York City designed for older LGBT veterans. New York is home to approximately one million men and women who served in their country, served their country in the armed forces, many of whom are LGBT. <laughs> New York State and New York City are among the top 10 cities with the highest concentrations of gay and lesbian veterans, both in number and per capita. And in fact, the Urban Institute estimates that there are over 38,000 lesbian and gay veterans living in New York, City, New York State with 17,000 residing in New York City. According to a statewide survey by the LGBT Health and Human Services Network of New York State, 56% of LGBT New Yorkers who identified as veterans were over the age of 50. Many LGBT older veterans in New York are struggling and yet not accessing the services they need, and the needs are deep among LGBT elder veterans. Consider that older elder LGBT veterans served in the military at a time when discrimination against LGBT people people was rampant and a matter of official government policy. For transgender people, serving in the military is still not a resolved issue. Older LGBT veterans have a unique set of needs that stem from discrimination and harassment and therefore have been reluctant to engage in VA and other veteran services that they might be Ill eligible for, fearing ignorant and inferior treatment from providers because of an individual's sexual orientation or gender identity. Furthermore, 
older LGBT veterans live in, an iso in isolation and usually do not have family caregivers to rely on when health be begins to deteriorate. And just to share a little story, just to qualify that, um, just yesterday uh, we were part of the TDF Veterans Theater Go Going Program, which is a terrific program, yeah. part of your initiative. Thank you so much for that. And um, we went to see the Colombian rock band, which was fantastic. Um, and one of the veterans who lived close to the theater, we've been trying to communicate with him and get him sign a, a document we need to get access to his uh, confirmation of service. He was a National Guardsman. Um, so I invited him. We walked together. We had some lunch. And he's just telling me a story about he hasn't talked to his brother in 15 years because he's, he's homophobic. Um, he, he had a really close relationship with his father who died. He's, his partner died. They had a really terrible situation. He said, but Sage makes me feel comfortable with who I am and I can talk about being gay and it's not a problem. He's in a, um, staying at the uh, Woodstock Senior Center over on 42nd Street or 43rd Street. Um, and it was just a marvelous day and he had a wonderful afternoon, so did I. Um, so to, I got a lot of stories, but just to carry on with my testimony, Sage Vets is the only program in New York City that serves LGBT people over the age of 50. And as a trusted LGBT organization, Sage's reputation and commitment to the LGBT people helps instill trust among them. And once that trust is established, we are able to get them the information they need and make the referrals to service providers because we understand their unique needs. And we also work with the providers to make sure that they understand the unique needs as well. And thanks to the generous support that we received from the New York City Council's Committee on Veterans in fiscal year 2020, we had the most productive productive year to date. Um, and thanks to this funding, we've raised the issue and visibility of elder LGBT veterans across the city. And we have also, uh, we, we got a SAGE vet uh, staff, or we've been presented and engaged with communities, forged and nurtured valuable partnerships, including the VA, VSOs, like the American Legion and VFW. We've also produced programs for older LGBT veterans in each of the five boroughs, all while offering life-saving and valuable case assistance to an individual veterans in need. Last year, we did a partnership program with the Black Veterans of Social Justice to address um, LGBT issues for people of color. Um, it was amazing. And then this coming month, we're celebrating Women's History Month. And we're doing something with the National Association of Black Military Women, um, the national president's com coming. Um, we also have a lesbian veteran from the Hudson Valley coming down to share her story about getting discriminated, at what le which led to her discharge. Um, it's going to be powerful. You're certainly invited to come. Um, and as an extension of Sage Vets' impact in New York State and to further the above, Sage's ongoing advocacy helped usher in the recent passage of the Restoration of Honor Act, which was signed by Governor Cuomo the day after Veterans Day. Thanks to Sage and our partners' advocacy work, along with the leadership of Senator Brad Hoyleman, the Restoration of Honor Act will enable LGBT veterans who received a less than honorable discharge due to their sexual orientation or gender identity to access veteran and supports at the state level. Sage is now advising the New York State Division of Veteran Services on impl implementation of this new legislation, and the launch is expected this spring. Um, and with the help from our legal partner, Veteran Advocacy Project, um, we just had our very first successful discharge upgrade with sev several others pending. Um, less than honorable discharges are fairly common among elder LGBT veterans. Um, and with the passing with the Restoration of Honor Act, Sage Vest will leverage its unique position to support LGBT older veterans through an increased number of discharge upgrades once the New York State Division of Veteran Services begins accepting applications. We're already seeing an uptick in inquiries, both from individuals and legislators. And just another quick story, NILAG helped us out um, with a Green Beret veteran from Vietnam um, who called me literally a week before he was gonna be evicted, or he had already been evicted. He was gonna lose all these archives from LGBT veteran memorabilia he had been saving. Well, thanks to NILAG, they worked miracles. They got him his keys back to his apartment. He's worked out a deal with Hasa to pay back the, the arrears he owes. We saved his archives, and we're working with the State Division of Veterans Services to get them uh, entered into the New York State Veterans Museum. Um, and also recently, Sage worked closely with Mayor Bill de Blasio's team providing data in support of the Discharge Upgrade Initiative that would fund legal service providers who assist veterans seeking a discharge upgrade at the federal level. This initiative was announced by Mayor as uh, Commissioner um, uh, uh, Hendon 
was discussing earlier. Um, the, another thing that we did recently is to discuss and do some research on minority veterans, including LGBT and people of color. We were one of the, the uh, 23 people that were interviewed. We also provided a focus group. There's great data in here. I'll share the electro electronic copy with you soon. Um, but just to like cut to the chase, we would love to continue doing this work at this level of support, and we're respectfully requesting a restoration of the, the grant that we had la this current year to perform outreach and address the veteran-related needs of the LGBT older veterans. So council members, thank you for your continue, continued support of SAGE. Uh, we look forward to partnering with you and continuing this work. Thank you, Ashton, and you could uh, count on that. Okay. And I don't know when you have time to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> I find it somehow, but thank you. Yeah, it's been a very exciting year. Thank you so much, Chair Deutsch. Okay. Thank you. Oh, yeah. <laughs> if you get some time, you could go to Rome, New York. I oh, would love to. Yeah, that's yeah. what yeah, okay. we have to talk. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> this would be great, an LGBTQ veterans rowing organization. Um, my name is Amanda Kraus. I'm the founder and CEO of Row New York. Thank you, Council Member Deutsch and um, other council members and, and everyone allies in the room. Um, I'm always so inspired hearing all the stories of the ever, everyone's work. Um, I started Row New York with the vision of bringing competitive rowing and academic support to underserved youth in New York City, and we added a veterans program about five years ago. About seven years ago, we started adaptive rowing for New Yorkers with disabilities, with cognitive and physical disabilities. So the entrance of a veterans rowing program um, came somewhat naturally to us, and we are so grateful to the support of our veterans rowing program from the council. Um, the Veterans Rowing Program provides opportunities to experience the sport of rowing for hundreds of New York City's veterans. The program is designed to help veterans and military service members avoid poor health outcomes such as obesity and depression by offering land-based and on-water workouts led by experienced rowing coaches. The veterans build strength, speed, endurance, and mobility and benefit from the opportunity to compete on a team, belong to a supportive community, and experience New York City's waterways. All three of our on-water locations are actually located in New York City parks. Recreational and competitive programs take place at the Peter J. Sharp Boathouse in Manhattan and the World's Fair Boathouse in Queens. Row New York proudly serves veterans with disabilities at our boathouses in Manhattan and Queens, VA centers, and we partner with veteran service organizations. Since 2013, when Row New York was certified by the U.S. Olympic Committee as a U.S. Paralympic Sports Club, the only club of its kind in New York City, we have continually worked to expand the reach of our adaptive programming and to build relationships with other organizations dedicated to expanding athletic opportunities for individuals with disabilities. The design of our program ensures that any veteran with a disability can choose an appropriate level from a one-time demonstration to regular competitive practice. I should note that not all of our veterans have disabilities. Some do and some do not, physical and cognitive. Um, our veterans rowing program encompasses the following. There's the competitive adaptive program where veterans meet three days a week to practice for competitive races, including the Crash B Indoor Rowing Championships in Boston, which took place last weekend, and the Mid-Atlantic Erg Sprints in Virginia. We also create individualized training plans for each rower based on his or her goals and needs. The recreational program involves veterans learning the fundamentals of rowing and building technique, improving mobility, enjoying outdoors, and outdoor and indoor workouts. Um, we also provide indoor rowing instruction at local VA centers in the Bronx, Manhattan, and Queens throughout the year. I would say that my one quick story is from a race we had on the Harlem River last spring where one of our um, fairly new, he's only been rowing with us about a year, veterans approached me at the course and you know, he, he said, I really appreciate this program, Amanda. And I said, well, we feel privileged to provide it. So, you know, don't, you don't need to thank me. Um, and he said, no, you don't understand what this means. And I thought, you know, I'm sure you've all experienced this when you run something and then people start telling you all about what's, you know, why it's valuable. And you're like, yes, that's why I do it. Um, I understand it. Um, but he said, no, you don't understand what this means to me and to my teammates. And I said, what is it? So what do you mean? And he said, I have not felt that I've been a part of a team um, since I was in combat. Um, and that was 25 years ago. But he's, this is, he's not a young man. Um, and he said, I finally feel like I'm a part of something again, and I'm a part of a team, and we're out on that river together, and it's so meaningful to me. 
And that I thought was really meaningful to hear, you know, that this group of individuals have this opportunity to be a part of something and work towards something together that's really um, positive. So I'd love to, we're always looking for more partners too. Um, and we're for, you know, certainly so grateful to the the, to the council, for the city, for the really invaluable support of the program. And come visit. You already have. Yes. <laughs> so thank you. Thanks. I definitely get together with Ashton. Yeah. yeah. Okay. You should really go. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I'm pretty good. Thank you. Oh, that was Hi, I'm Coco Colhane, the Executive Director of VAP, Veteran Advocacy Project, and um, so we spun off from the Urban Justice Center this year, and we are now an independent uh, nonprofit, a leaner, more efficient machine. Um, and uh, instead of you, know, I won't go through all of our initiatives, and you guys are familiar, um, so I won't waste anyone's time. But I did want to highlight that we're really trying to move towards being as holistic a legal provider as possible. Um, and in doing that, we have launched our criminal defense practice with um, Captain Art Cody, who will speak to you about that in detail. Um, but it's really been um, a terrific addition. And I wanted to share just one story that kind of exemplifies all of these different aspects that, and how they come together. Um, we were working with the Veterans Justice Outreach from the VA. They told us about um, veterans at Rikers who needed our help. We started going out there regularly. Um, we met a Marine who had come back, he had spent 10 years in, in prison, came back, tried to go contact SSVF providers, tried to get job programs, wasn't getting through to anyone, right, wasn't getting those calls back soon enough. He eventually, uh, you know, went back to what he knew how to do, which was selling drugs. That's how he ended up at Rikers, where we met him. Um, so we sat down with him and basically just pleaded with him, like, we can maybe cut through some of that red tape for you, can you just stick it out? Um, and what happened was the reentry organization he was working with assigned him to a methadone program that was not familiar with PTSD. They, they didn't really know how to work with him. He got kicked out. Um, um, the clinic was nowhere near where he lived. Things fell apart, right? And um, so our intake advocate tracked him, basically just kept saying, we're here, we're here, and we've got detox for you if you want it. And he would call every couple of weeks from link stations. And finally, he said, you know, I'm done, I'm ready. And so he came in, we got him hooked up with a detox program, then he went into Samaritan Village. Um, and I'm just, we're working on his character of discharge. Um, he was, there was an attempted rape in the Marines. He's then started using drugs. He's a bad, so that's why he has a less than honorable discharge. Um, and his life has just been really difficult since then. So we're working on all these different issues. We're working, advocating on his housing. And he actually just texted me this morning a picture. He got married, and they have a Hudvash Continuum voucher. And um, he's like, you know, he's really starting his life over. And some of that, most of that is not legal, but it's all coming together. And that's, that's where I think that our work really can make a difference. Um, and I just want to uh, revisit a topic which, you know, when we kind of were talking about Vet Connect and referrals and how expensive referrals are, um, to just remind everyone that there are really long waiting lists for both uh, claims appeals and discharge upgrades, um, you know, the city bar and ours, we've actually had to just turn our phone off. Our entire intake line is just gone now because we cannot handle all the volume. Um, and. Finally, just want to say that, you know, if those, we're so grateful for everything that the committee has done and, and expanding the Veterans Legal Initiative um, money, and we just hope that they're used for veterans law. Those dollars go to um, this unmet need where there's just, there's so many vets waiting. And uh, it's really hard when they call and we have to just say, you're on the list and, and we're trying. So. Um, we hope that those dollars are really dedicated towards those unique legal issues. Thank you. Thank you. All right, thank you, panel. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>
Uh, okay. Uh, Jody Ruin. Hi. Uh, Arts. Cody. Uh, James Fitzgerald. And Tawaki. So Tawaki, you went first last time, so now we'll have go the other way, right? Go ahead. Good afternoon, Chair Deutsch and fellow City Council members. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to testify here today. My name is Jody Rudin, and I'm the Chief Operating Officer at Project Renewal, a New York City homeless services nonprofit. For more than 53 years, Project Renewal has empowered individuals and families who are homeless or at risk of homelessness to renew their lives through critical programs focused on health, homes, and jobs. Each year, we serve nearly 15,000 New Yorkers, including hundreds of veterans. We are grateful to Speaker Johnson, Chair Deutsch, and the City Council for their generous support of Project Renewal's Homelessness Prevention Services for Veterans, support that has been crucial for us to help veterans across all of our programs. In fiscal year 2019, we provided health care to over 140 veterans at our mobile medical vans and shelter-based clinics and through our psychiatry and substance use disorder programs. And we successfully placed more than a quarter of the veterans living in our homeless shelters into permanent housing. In the past two years, over 87% of the veterans we have admitted to our housing programs have successfully maintained their housing thanks to our ongoing support. But what I want to focus on today is the life-changing impact that our workforce development programs have had on the veterans we serve. We believe that the individuals who have served our country deserve sustainable employment and a living wage. A 33-year-old Staten Islander named Shaban is the perfect example of how Project Renewal's comprehensive services help veterans overcome the complex challenges they face. After serving in the Army, Shaban had trouble finding a stable career, a problem that far too many veterans face in our city. She experienced homelessness and struggled to support her young children. Then Shaban enrolled in Next Step, which is one of our workforce development programs. In Next Step, we prepared her for a career in social services. Shaban received training in nonviolent crisis intervention and in opioid overdose prevention as well as in financial literacy. Today, Shaban is employed full-time as a case manager. Her inspiring story, story motivates her clients to overcome their own challenges. We want to continue renewing the lives of veterans like Shaban. With further support from the City Council, we have an opportunity to expand our workforce development programs and ensure that more veterans achieve the economic stability they need to live independently. I'm sorry, I, I was trying to be efficient and I skipped down a little bit. I'm now towards the tail end of the testimony. I wanted to just express that we're ready to work with each council member to ensure their veteran constituents are being served and never forgotten. And we remind all present that Project Renewal is a resource their office can call upon any time. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. Thank you. Thank you, Jolie. Thank you. And, you know, I like these stories. <laughs> Yeah, today's like story day. <laughs> We've been hearing a lot of success stories. So well, we're transforming lives, and we wanted you to hear good. about it. We that's really excellent. appreciate yeah. your support. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair and Council members, uh, for this opportunity. Before I begin my official testimony, I would like to uh, bring up an issue about uh, communication between uh, whatever entity within the council uh, sends out communications for the hearings, um, just to relook at efforts to ensure that community stakeholders get uh, communications about any reschedulings. Uh, us at the NYC Veterans Alliance got no notification about this upcoming hearing. Mm. Uh, it just so happened through our due diligence of uh, checking the council website and making sure that we're up to speed on 
uh, the actions of the council that we were able to make it here today. But unfortunately, I was able, I was unable to uh, provide the additional copies of my testimony. So I apologize for that. But I just like to uh, re-examine efforts uh, for communication uh, from the council to our community stakeholders. All right, we'll definitely find out how you could sign up, and uh, we'll get back to you. Thank you, Chair. You'll get the notifications. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, and thank you to Chair Deutsch and committee members for this opportunity to testify today. My name is James Fitzgerald, and I'm the Deputy Director of NYC Veterans Alliance, a member-driven grassroots policy advocacy and community-building organization that advances veterans and military families as civic leaders. We work with more than 150 community organizations across the New York City metro area to promote events for veterans and families posted online at ourveterans.nyc. Our year-round online resource hub visited by more than 4,000 users each month, each month. We also remain the only organization dedicated to local level advocacy for veterans and families here in New York City. I greatly appreciate the opportunity to present testimony before you today. The New York City Veterans Alliance was a key advocate for the creation of the Department of Veterans Services to support our city's approximate population of 210,000 veterans, about one-fourth of our state's veterans, plus an estimated 250,000 caregivers and family members connected to those veterans. Our membership strongly supports our continuous efforts to set high expectations for the role of DVS in New York City and beyond, and there is much to be optimistic as we look at the future of DVS. Uh, when it comes to the testimony presented by Commissioner Hendon, we were uh, greatly pleased to see their uh, increased uh, efforts towards outreach and taking away the geographic component and looking more towards the demographic. So we're uh, looking forward to working with the commissioner on increased efforts to improve the services that are rendered uh, in that respect uh, when it comes to outreach. Uh, we would like to continue to put the pressure on the uh, council to uh, create a budget line for an agency chief uh, contracting officer. It was delightful to hear about the director of contracting, uh, but one piece that was lacking from that description of the position was oversight on council discretionary funds, which is a uh, vital component of that position, not only to look at the contracts that the Department of Veterans Services currently uh, has under their belt, but also the discretionary funds that are going out to veteran service organizations to ensure that those services are being rendered to standard and proper oversight is rendered inside the agency. Um, so uh, I'll continue on. DVS needs the ability to manage and monitor their, their significant contract with Northwell for Vet Connect NYC, as currently overseen by DCAS, uh, an agency that does not have the fluency or cultural competency with veteran services. Um, the contracting and uh, procurement expertise can enhance the agency's ability to provide crucial oversight for discretionary funds from the council to organizations that provide services to veterans and their families, as well as managing its own request for protocol uh, processes. Oversight of city funds going to veteran services is a basic agency responsibility and would at last bring DVS into alignment with the state and federal counterparts. We urge the council to ensure DVS has no further delays on establishing and managing contracts and procurement going forward as this is a necessary function for DVS to truly operate as an independent agency. Uh, we strongly also urge that DVS establish in-house capability to provide consul consultation on and direct filing of DVS claims. Uh, NYC Veterans Alliance, uh, you know, is uh, completely on board and thankful for New York State Division of Veterans Services for providing New York City DVS with uh, VA accreditation training. So we're hoping that that trend can continue down to the community level so we can spread this information around to ensure that it's reaching uh, veterans at the community level. Um, it is incumbent on local government to step up with VA accredited staff who do have this capability. DVS's community outreach staff are currently not able to offer direct assistance with VA claims, so this service is referred out. Uh, with increased funding projected for the next fiscal year, we strongly urge the council to support DVS in being able to provide this essential services to our community. Um, one of the 
core issues also that was discussed today was about our homeless veteran population. Uh, and the figure was given of 684 currently utilizing the shelter system. Uh, the key word inside of that that I'd like to emphasize uh, for the commissioner and for uh, the general public is it's a homeless shelter. So those 684 veterans are homeless. So like uh, understanding that they are within the homeless shelter, we should be looking at how we can get them towards an outcome of stabilized housing and out of the shelter system completely. Um, along with that, uh, DVS's core services and accomplishments should be accurately reflected in the annual mayor's management report, and it should also be transparent about areas where more support for improvement is needed. Um, the MMR also shows the number of community members engaged and given assistance, but the definitions of these metrics I feel are lacking, and I think we can do a much more sophisticated uh, reporting uh, when it comes to uh, the story behind the outcomes of the veterans that are currently inside the uh, shelter system, but are currently uh, homeless uh, by DVS's definition. Um, we look forward to improved reporting of DVS's impacts in future years and improved transparency about, few, uh, about further support DVS needs. Thank you for this opportunity to offer testimony today. Pending your questions, this concludes my testimony. Much. I agree with, uh, I think, everything you said. So, thank you. As Coco mentioned, uh, my name is Art Cody. I'm the director of criminal programs at the Veteran Advocacy Project. I welcome the opportunity to testify before you today on the needs of our veterans in the justice systems and how VAP, the Veterans, Veteran Advocacy Project, is uniquely designed to meet those needs. But I think perhaps more importantly, I come before you today as a 34-year veteran of the armed services, my most recent combat tours to Afghanistan. What was particularly distressing to me, and I, I think in all sincerity a better word is heartbreaking to me, was what our troops particularly our young enlisted soldiers, our, our National Guardsmen in particular, go through. The, it, it can't be understated the amount of um, danger, uh, fear, sometimes abject terror, um, and in many cases death. Um, how much of this our troops are seeing on a relatively daily basis? Um, None of our troops come home the same way they went over. None of them. There is an old expression in the Army uh, that in war there are no unwounded soldiers. And I found that to be absolutely the truth both when I was over there and as well as in my, my veteran advocacy upon my return to the United States. Um, I find, though, that when they return, we as a society don't always give them the therapy and the treatment they need to reintegrate. And I think this is most pronounced with respect to post-traumatic stress issues. Now, some veterans are, very, are able to cope with the stress, with the trauma, better than others. In many of our veterans' cases, they had mental health issues prior to their deployments. And I can tell you, and I don't think it'll be any surprise, Neither Iraq nor Afghanistan are particularly therapeutic environments. Um, so when they come home, they have significant issues. And what happens is veterans commonly encounter the criminal justice system when they're trying to reintegrate back into civilian society. Um, and most of the time, when they're trying to do that, they either have little or no mental health support. Um, typically, and this is particularly true, what I found in, in the case of uh, New York Army National Guardsmen, um, the Army understandably wants to get them off the federal payroll as quickly as possible. So they are rapidly discharged into society with really no follow-on care plan. Um, and they're trying to get back into a family, into a job, into a social circle. With rare exception, none of these groups are able to understand what the veteran has gone through. Um, 
Now, if we use the VA statistics, roughly one third of our veterans, of our Afghan, Iraq era veterans, are suffering from mental health issues. And to define those, we're really talking about post traumatic stress issues, traumatic brain injury, um, major depression, uh, substance abuse issues. We are looking at literally countless veterans in New York City. One of the common charges that I see in the courts are, are weapons possessions. And part of the underlying reason why veterans are getting weapons possession charges is because guns are so um, part of what they do every day. I mean, literally, they are part of the prescribed uniform. Socks, shoes, belt, gun. Um, they're literally used to carrying them around. So, and what what happens is you have a veteran who was what he was required to do, say in February in Afghanistan, that is have a loaded weapon, will get him three and a half to fifteen years in August when he comes home. Um, so, I, I think one of the most important things I can do um, with a veteran is to point out to a court that often if a, if a veteran has a weapon, I'm not so limited to weapons charges, but I think it's a good example of the kind of things, the kind of trouble vets get in. Um, commonly, it's either because the veteran didn't, was not aware of New York's gun laws or um, if a veteran is contemplating suicide, commonly they will have the weapon in the car to enable them to do that. Um, recently, I've had both those cases. Um, only about 7% of the population of the United States is veterans. One of the most important things I do is to explain in depth to a prosecutor, a judge, or jury about the veteran's experience. To translate this strange, um, traumatic experience so as to foster the understanding of a district attorney so maybe the charges are changed. To foster compassion, to engender compassion, to get that vet the, to get that vet the treatment he needs. Um, and now how I do this is primarily, and I do this commonly at Rikers Island and other facilities in New York, is I will sit down and I will talk to this veteran in a a vet-to-vet a, a -vet conversation to understand what, what where this vet has been. I will gather the records. I will decipher all the, the acronyms. I will reach out to his colleagues. I will build the brief, I'll submit the brief, and I will or orally argue it in court. Um, what I find happens is once that's done and the veteran's story has been told, because that's really my mission is to tell that veteran's story, commonly the disposition goes from, well, we were going to give him five years in prison because that's it's a relatively light sentence for that particular crime. It goes from five years in prison to six months of treatment. In both the cases I just mentioned to you, the bringing the weapon in because of ignorance of the law, as well as the suicidal vet, that's exactly what happened. The vet went from looking at five years in prison to six months in six months in treatment. Um, what we find in the veterans advocacy veteran advocacy program uh, project is vets don't suffer from a a single issue. Very commonly. The veterans I work with also have housing issues. They have education issues. They have discharge upgrade issues. One of the real advantages to the Veteran Advocacy Project is we have the resources on board. While I am working on the criminal disposition, we have the resources on board to help that veteran get into housing, to get that discharge upgrade, to put that veteran into education. Um, so I ask your assistant in funding the Veterans Advocacy Project, particularly in the newly established criminal programs, um, to help us to, uh, to continue to serve our veterans. And I, I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Art. Mr. Joyce, um, I think you and I previously had a conversation where you gave me a business card and you asked um, someone who lives in my building to reach out to you. I don't know if they did, No. Um, but I gave that business card to somebody in my, in my building. Um, about three months ago, someone passed away in my building. She went to the hospital, um, came back, she collapsed in the lobby. There was a security guard in the lobby. She asked that person for assistance getting back to her apartment. He refused. 
So um, ultimately, someone assisted her back to her apartment. Over the weekend, she passed away. Um, the landlord of my building's Urban Pathways. I think I told you about them previously. I got 15 punches to my head because they subjected me to a bait and switch with the lease I signed with HRA, where HRA actually fraudulently changed my lease two days after I signed it. Um, I've asked HRA to give me records about what they've done um, in response to my complaints dating back to March of 2016. Stephen Banks and I, we've had conversations. He told me that he won't comply. So I guess bottom line is um, all the government contracts are financed by taxpayers. So why should taxpayers have to continue funding contracts with an entity that is causing people like me to have 15 punches strike our left temple, to cause us to get a concussion, and when we walk into an interview, our cognitive capabilities aren't in order such that we don't get the job interview for something that would have paid us $450 a day. Um, because, yeah, there was some discussion about HRA earlier today. Um, I also previously prevailed in litigation against that same slumlord um, through a decision that a judge issued in November of last year. But then um, they filed a new lawsuit against me where they're claiming that uh, a valid lease has existed where none has. So in terms of the discussion that has been um, discussed in this room today about legal assistance, how much funding can you, I guess, uh, earmark for military veterans such that if they have to go against HRA that actually provides funding to legal organizations, there's no conflict of interest, and that can have a judge issue a subpoena against HRA to find out how many other people it, it has committed fraud against and what has been the repercussions of that fraud. So um, I'm actually the one asking the questions today. Do you have right. testimony? Uh, you, we could speak afterwards, or you could email me the questions. But if you have any testimony, I would love to hear it. Sure. If you have any questions, or if anyone in your building, like I mentioned before, has any issues, they should email me directly, and okay. they will be handled. Uh, so, so far, I haven't received any emails of any of the things that you did discuss with me. And before. I guess to close out, but if you have any, if you have any testimony, I would love to hear it. I do. If um, you have any questions? You could just. Uh, so, with regards to, I guess. Budget issues, I mean, this is really a budget hearing for veteran services. Um, if HRA is issuing proposed contracts for veterans. If it's a question, then I'm not okay, answering. I'll rephrase it. Um, if, you, if you want to have testimony, you could have testimony. Otherwise, we have many um, organizations that offer legal services that are funded. Sure. Um, I guess I'll leave it for a private conversation. Okay. okay. Thank you. Thank you all very much, and I want to thank um, all the advocates for coming down today and giving up their time. And uh, we're looking forward to a good year um, working together with you and also with the DBS Commissioner, James Hendon. So thank you all very much. God bless you all. God bless the United States of America. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The meeting is now adjourned. <laughs>